Hello everyone. In this video I would like to discuss John Donne's divine poems, his religious poems, and I would like to begin by a um, quick review of what we said in our discussion of his songs and sonnets. Um, in the songs and sonnets, uh, what Donne is primarily interested in, it seems to me, is discussing a love that is all-consuming, that is soul-satisfying, that is in at least two of the poems we discussed, best and cap best depicted as a complete and total world, a complete and total universe. That is to say that the love that the speaker enjoys then is a love which is complete, soul satisfying, utterly filling, and um, uh, meets all of his needs. This is a love that gives the person his complete and total identity. If you recall in The Good Morrow, he essentially gets his identity. He begins his being at the moment that he has fallen in love. Uh, it is a marvelous and magnificent picture, one of the finest pictures of love that we have in English lyric poetry. And yet it raises an interesting question. And that is, if this love is so exceptional, if this love is so foundational and definitional of one's identity, if it's so total and complete, what happens when that love comes to an end? E even if uh, the love is perfect and complete in and of itself, what happens when the beloved, for example, should die? Logically, therefore, if the beloved should die and the beloved is absolutely everything to the lover, then the lover will be left with absolutely nothing. It will be a complete and devastating loss. Very different, say, from the loss of if you have a pet, no matter how much you love that pet, that pet won't be absolutely, completely, totally everything to you, it won't define your existence. So when you lose the pet, life will still go on. Part of you, of course, will be lost with the pet, but the greater part of you will remain. But that's not the case for the kind of love that Dunn is describing. And this situation of being deprived of the beloved, uh, if the beloved, for example, should die, is precisely what Dunn is discussing in his uh, wonderful and very challenging poem, A Nocturnal Upon St. Lucy's Day Being the Shortest Day. So St. <clears throat> Lucy's Day is, uh, of the title is December 13th, and it's coming hard on the shortest day of the year, December 21st, and uh, lux, lux, lucius in Latin meaning light, St. Lucy then is the patron saint of light, celebrated uh, longingly at the darkest time of year. And so when the, the year as, is at its darkest, at its coldest, uh, Dunn is taking that as his, um, which we say the context, to reflect his own life. He has now been deprived of the great joy of love and is left dark and cold with absolutely nothing. I should say, by the way, that in... Um, uh, in traditional Christian teaching, beginning with St. Augustine, if not before, the general explanation for evil is that evil is not something that exists. If you take that view that evil doesn't actually exist, then you get around the thorny problem of if God creates all that exists, then did he create evil? No, said St. Augustine and those who follow him. Evil is not something that actually exists. Evil is a lack. And here the universal illustration of evil as a lack is uh, with reference to darkness, for instance. Darkness. If you uh, enter a cave as a tourist, let's say, sometimes you'll have the experience of a darkness that's so thick and so heavy it almost seems like it is something. But in fact, a moment's thought will reassure you that darkness is nothing in and of itself. Darkness is just the lack or the absence of light. Same thing is true of cold. You can uh, go out of doors on a bitterly cold January morning uh, and that cold can, as we would say, slap you in the face. It feels as if the cold is a thing, but in fact the cold is just the absence of heat, the physicists tell us. So 
uh, here, Dunn is talking about the evil of deprivation of love and what that comes to mean. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time discussing the poem in detail, but I do want to refer to several passages. Uh, the first stanza, which I won't read in great detail, sets the uh, provides the setting that uh, everything is cold and dark and the sap now in winter has fallen down to the roots of the trees. Everything is dead. And then he begins really in earnest of talking about why this condition should be important as a subject of poem. He says in stanza two, study me then, you who shall lovers be at the next world, that is the next spring. So those of you who think love is good and wonderful and uh, wouldn't mind falling in love when springtime comes around and the flowers are budding and so on, uh, let me offer you this word of caution. Study me, because love, no matter how wonderful it can be, also comes with it a very great peril. Uh, for I am every dead thing in whom love wrought new alchemy. Alchemy is also one of the background, intellectual backgrounds to this poem. I won't uh, go in, I won't discuss it in much depth or detail because one can understand the poem without a great deal of, uh, a great deal of, um, what should we say, experience of studying alchemy. But alchemy is, as we mentioned last time, that old uh, medieval and Renaissance idea that by certain uh, part magic and part uh, crude kind of physics one can in chemistry one can turn base common cheap metals into precious metals like gold. Um, uh, so it's a kind of magical transformation one might say in whom love wrought new alchemy for his art did express express as, a, as an, a technical alchemical term but literally in its root it means to press out, uh, did express a quintessence even from nothingness. So the quintessence is the fourth essence, the indefinable something that makes every individual thing that exists itself. So if, we, uh, if, if you took me and divided me into all my parts, broke me down chemically into all my atoms, nevertheless, there, that wouldn't be me. Um, if you took all those atoms and reassembled them, still what you'd be missing is the quintessence. There's a fifth essence, by the way, fifth, because according to the ancient Greeks, uh, everything in the universe was composed of four basic elements, earth, water, air, and fire, but there is a fifth kind of um, essence very essence that gives the definition, that gives the absolute indistinguish, that gives the absolute uh, character that distinguishes one thing from another. Um, he is the absolute pure essence, in other words, of nothingness, like cold and dark. Um, for I'm every dead thing in whom love wrought new alchemy, for his art did express a quintessence even from nothingness. So no av ordinary average nothingness. He is the absolute uh, definition, we might say, of nothingness. From dull privations and lean emptiness, he ruined me, and I am rebegot, I am reborn of absence, darkness, death, things which are not. So he used to exist, but now that... Uh, I've experienced this love, which is absolutely everything, and that love is presently taken away from me. Now I'm absolutely nothing. Not, and I'm not just nothing like any average ordinary nothing. I'm the very uh, quintessence. I'm the very essence of nothingness. All others from all things draw all that's good. So anything, that, if evil is the lack of existence, then obviously anything, conversely, anything that exists will be good. So the very existence of anything is a good thing. Um, life, soul, form, spirit, whence they being have. Anything that gives being to something else, it's all good. Hence, when God created things and they came to exist, he said that it was good. I, by love's alembic, the alembic is the, uh, is the sort of chemical apparatus that uh, finds the very distillation of the uh, pure substances. I, by love's limbic, am the grave of all that's nothing. So take nothing and then kill nothing, and the resulting nothing square, nothingness squared, let's say, the pure refinement of nothing, is, what's, is what he has become. Oft a flood have we too wept, and so drowned the whole world us too. Oft we did grow to be two chaoses when we cared about anything else, and often absences withdrew our souls and made us carcasses. You can read about uh, how their souls um, dealt with absence in 
uh, the valediction forbidding morning. But I am by her death, which word wrongs her, of the first nothing, the elixir ground. So the very first nothing before God created anything, the sheer absence and void. He is the pure elixir of that. Uh, were I a man, that I were one, I needs must know. Uh, he's writing this around the time, maybe a little before the time Descartes is writing his meditations and his discourses. Descartes realizes if he denies absolute, the existence of absolutely everything, the one thing he can't deny is that he thinks, right? And so Dunn seems to anticipate that idea here, even if I denied everything else. Um, if I were a man, I would at least have the capacity for reason. Um, I should, uh, even I were, if I were an animal, I would prefer one thing or another. Your dog will prefer uh, a nice fine steak, for instance, to his dog food. Uh, dogs can, animals have preferences to do one thing or another. Some ends, some means. Even plants, yet stones detest and love. The idea that um, before Newton comes along with his general theory of gravity, the question still remains, why does a stone fall to the ground? And the old idea is that it was love that attracts these two things, as we've mentioned before. Um, in our discussion of Dunn's poetry, we might define love as two different things coming together. So the stone uh, goes, uh, falls to the ground, comes together with the ground as a form of love. That's why he can say, yeah, even stones hate and love all, all some properties and best. So everything has some property, no matter how simple or trivial it is. If I an ordinary nothing were a shadow, a lighter body must be here, right? So um, even shadows our typical ordinary nothing, but he is the pure substance, the pure elixir of nothingness, as he says. But I am none, nor will my son renew. You lovers, for whose sake the lesser son, the greater son was his love, um, but the lesser son, that ordinary son that we have in the sky every day, uh, when um, he is in the sign of uh, Capricorn here uh, in December, uh, to fetch new lust, the Capricorn is symbolized by a goat. Goats are very lustful animals. So Dunn imagines that the sun here uh, in December in the sign of Capricorn is, uh, is stoking up its lust so that when springtime comes around, everything can get busy and reproduce. Enjoy your summer all. Uh, enjoy the time you have uh, when you get to go out and love and exist. I myself uh, am nothing. Since she enjoys her long nights festival, that is, she has died now. Let me prepare towards her. And this is absolutely key in Dunn. Let me prepare towards her. She has died, and therefore I realize that this kind of love that I've been celebrating in my other love poems ultimately uh, has this downside. And so if she is everything to me, then I need to start thinking about heavenly things where she is. Let me prepare towards her and let me call this hour her vigil and her eve since this, both the years and the days, deep midnight is. So really a poem that rings the changes on the idea of nothingness that uh, the speaker has experienced due to the death of that love, which to him was absolutely everything. A similar poem, and it's a good um, uh it's a good uh, introduction, perhaps, to the divine poems. And here I'm going to look just at a, a brief portion of this poem. And that is Holy Sonnet 17. Uh, by the way, uh, I should say there are two different manuscripts, at least, of Dunn's uh, Holy Sonnets. And so they're numbered slightly differently. And it depends on which, if you're not, if you don't yet have the green tome, the Witherspoon and Warnke, it depends on which um, manuscript your editor is using. But this is the, uh, according to which uh, sonnet is numbered in which way. But um, Holy Sonnet 17, it's the more usual numbering. It's the sonnet that begins, since she whom I loved hath paid her last debt to nature. That is, she has died. Your last debt to nature is that you must die. So she whom I loved has now died and my good is dead. Everything that was good and wonderful to me about love and about life is now dead and gone, right? And her soul early into heaven ravished. Yes, her soul now is taken up to heaven. Therefore, since he loves her so much and she is everything to him, therefore, wholly, completely on heavenly things, my mind is set. 
So uh, she has been removed from him, taken up into heaven, and so now his mind is going to start thinking about, no longer thinking about her as his earthly beloved, but is now going to start thinking about heaven. A uh, couple of words about this. The first is uh, to revert to Plato. We had talked about uh, Plato's uh, dialogue of the symposium, in which these various characters drinking all the night through uh, discourse on the definition of and meaning of love. Um, and one of the, uh, Socrates, in fact, talks about how, when it's his turn to speak, talks about how he learned about love from a witch named Diotima, uh, a sorceress or an enchantress, and Diotima taught him that love is a kind of ladder. One falls in love with the physical body first, and then one comes to realize as one looks around that not only the beloved is beautiful, but others are beautiful as well. Therefore, there must be an abstract quality called beauty. And then one falls, then one graduates from being in love with a body to being in love with a thing called beauty. And then as one is in love with beauty, one looks around and sees that there are other good qualities like um, like fairness or justice or these kinds of things. And so one then and is no longer in love simply with beauty, but one is in love one is in love with the good. And the good essentially in uh, Neoplatonic Christian teaching then becomes God. And so this idea that love is a ladder which leads us from an earthly object to a heavenly object. That's one background for a poem like this by Dunn. Um, and it's uh, well to keep that in mind. And in fact, later on in this poem, he talks about a uh, following the course of a uh, spring, a spring up a mountainside, you see it uh, running downhill. And so you follow that spring, uh, which runs by your feet. You follow it up to its source, up at the top of the hill. Um, so his love then he follows back to its heavenly or divine source. Uh, and so back to the question that we did, began this uh, video with, and that is the question, if love is absolutely everything, completely soul-satisfying, when one is deprived of that love, then one is left with nothing. One has the realization then that no matter how wonderful that love can be temporarily, the problem is that the object of one's love, that is the beloved, must always be imperfect in the sense at least that the beloved must die. And so if one wants a complete, total, soul-satisfying kind of love, one must necessarily then have as one's beloved someone who is completely and totally perfect and can't die. And obviously the only beloved of that kind that one can find is God. He will never die. He will never change. And so if one is completely, totally, utterly in love with God and enjoys an, uh, a complete and total relationship with him, then one finally will have arrived at the perfection of the love which answers every need and which can never come to an end. That's the decisive point. It can never come. It's as good as the love that Dunn writes about in the songs and sonnets, but better in that it can never come to an end. Well, if that's the case, follow the logic here. Now we have found a perfect beloved, a perfect object for our affections. God, he can never die. But wait a minute, what about the lover? What about, uh, what about we who are loving? We're not perfect compared with God. We are sinful and flawed. And so Dunn's religious poems, while they are also striving toward the kind of perfect, complete, soul-satisfying love that he discusses in the songs and sonnets, they're also fraught with the consciousness that the speaker is sinful and that the speaker needs to be reformed. And that's why uh, he mentioned, that's why, that's sort of, essentially, that's the main theme of Holy Sonnet 14, probably the most famous of Dunn's Holy Sonnets. Batter my heart, three-person God. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. 
Yes, the problem is that the speaker is unresponsive to God. It's not that God is not perfect, but that the speaker in his imperfection is unresponsive to God. So unresponsive that to this point, while God has gently been knocking and breathing and shining, uh, the speaker, uh, it, ha it hasn't done the speaker much good. The speaker demands a kind of uh, violence uh, to be thrown down. And here I might point out that... Um, Dunn is keenly aware that Christianity is the religion of paradox, the two central Christian teachings of Christianity. One is the Trinity, that there are, that God is three distinct beings in one person. How is that possible? I am a distinct being, and my, each member of my family is a distinct being, and close as we are, we are not one person. God, uh, the members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are as distinct as individual members of my family, and yet, nevertheless, they are one being, as you individually are one person. It's a paradox. How can that be? It's uh, impossible to explain, but it's a paradox. The other central teaching of Christianity, uh, the hypostatic union, um, that Christ is the Son of God completely totally, fully God, just as much as is God the Father or God the Spirit, and yet uh, he is also fully, completely, totally human, um, like any human being who's walked the earth, flesh and blood and human. How can this be? Uh, God is God, humans are humans, and yet Christ is both at the same, but fully and completely, he's not half and half, he's both fully and completely and totally at the same time. So Christianity is the religion of paradox, and this poem is built upon paradoxes that are inherent in Christianity. In fact, the very first line he mentions, three-person God. Uh, this poem is much about God using his force to break, break Dunn's heart, I should say, the speaker's hard heart, um, to get the speaker to respond, so he could very easily, and it would have fit the meter perfectly, batter my heart, almighty God, right? A God who can use great force and power. But no, he refers to the three-person God precisely because the Trinity is paradoxical, and this poem is very paradoxical, that I may rise, that you, that you, for God to heal him, he wants God to violently hurt him, that he can, so that he can stand up, he needs God to throw him down. So all of these paradoxes of the human's relationship with God. I, like a usurped town, to another do. So here we have the image of a town that has been captured. Um, I sometimes talk to my students in this fashion, if you think about uh, uh, where the University of West Alabama is in the town of Livingston, uh, pretty close inside the state line. Uh, let's say Alabama and Mississippi were at war with one another. The town of Livingston should belong to, oh, and we should imagine, too, the town of Livingston has old medieval walls around it. Um, it belongs to the state of Alabama, but it's been usurped. It's been taken over by the forces from Mississippi. And so this character who lives in Livingston, so now it's occupied by the forces from Mississippi, but forces from Alabama are surrounding it. They just can't get back in and occupy the city because the defense is too strong. So the speaker would like to throw open the gates to the city and let the proper forces in. Um, yes, I like, a, uh, I like a usurped town to another do. I labor to admit you. I labor to let you in, but oh to no end. I try very much to let God into my life, but it doesn't work. Reason, you're a viceroy in me. This is a point that we're going to have to spend a moment talking about because it's so absolutely crucial to so many of the writers we're going to be reading later in the course. Uh, reason, God's viceroy. What is a viceroy? Well, it means a vice king in the same way that vice president means vice president. Vice, vice in Latin, meaning in the place of. So if you imagine the, uh, the king of Spain living in Madrid in the uh, 1600s, but he has Mexico to govern and he's got so much of South America to govern, how does he do it in the age before Skype or FaceTime, in the age before international, for easy international travel? Well, the way he does it is he takes a vice king, uh, literally a viceroy, puts one in Mexico and puts one in Peru, and they govern in the place of the king. What that means is that reason, our intellect, is 
God's viceroy in us. God has gone back up to heaven, but he has put reason in us to govern our actions, to ensure that we uh, choose right and avoid wrong. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means if you go back to the account of Genesis, of the creation, when God creates human beings, he creates them in his own image, right? Well, what is God? Uh, at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, John didn't actually write those words, because those words are in English, and English didn't exist in those days. John wrote in Greek, enache en horlogos, kai horlogos en prostonteon kai theos en horlogos. Um, in the beginning was the logos, in the beginning, usually translated word. Well, logos is the, is the basis for the Greek word logic or reason. God is reason. God is intellect. Uh, he is the one who has the reason or the intellect, the mental firepower, as it were, to create this entire universe and keep it uh, moving together according to the appropriate laws. So our reason, our intellect in us is God's image, and God gives us that in order. Uh, he, is, he has gone away. He has given us free will. He doesn't immediately control everything we do, but he's given us reason to uh, control our actions. Um, reason, your viceroy in the me should defend, but as we all know from our own experience, we know what is right to do, but often we don't do it, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain. Uh, he loves God and he wants God to love him back. But the problem is that done is too close to God's enemy, too close to Satan, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me. That is, he wants God to, divorce, to break the close relationship that the speaker has with God's enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me. For I accept you and thrall me, never shall be free. Thrall is an old Icelandic word which means slave. The only way for done, here's paradox upon paradox, the only way for the speaker to be free is if he is a slave to God. How, will that, how can that be? Well, uh, the, an interesting exercise perhaps is to take all of St. Paul's letters in the New Testament, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and so on, and just read the first verse. And what you'll find, it's an exercise of five minutes. What you'll very often find is that Paul will call himself, a, in the English translation, servant. Uh, Paul, a servant of Christ. In fact, what the Greek typically says is Paulos doulos Christu, Paul, a slave of Christ. The only way to be truly free and to do truly what, to live the life uh, God has in plan, plan for us is to be subservient to him. The only way the speaker of this poem can be truly free is by being enslaved to Christ. And then a very startling uh, final line. The only way he can ever be chaste, that is sexually pure, it's, our, uh, it's the root of our word chastity, is if Christ ravishes him, ravish a variant of the word rape. And back we are again uh, to what to Dunn's um, use of language in the flea. If you recall in the flea, there the speaker is wanting to get the girl to hop into the sack with him, and he uses religious language to promote that argument. Here he has a religious poem, and he's using sexual language to promote that argument. It may seem a bit shocking and strange to us, uh, and by the way, notice that the no notion of rape combines both the idea of a uh, odd for, I mean, it's, uh, one hates to even say this, but he's been talking about love and attraction and also about violence. So one can talk about it as a kind of violent love or a kind of violent attraction too. Um, so, it combines, so that last line combines those two concerns from earlier in the poem. One, um, um, uh, the, the idea may be shocking to talk about sexual things in a religious context, but uh, one, remind, one is reminded, for instance, that right in the middle of the Bible comes the, a book called the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, which can be pretty explicit at times about the rela sexual relationship between Solomon and one of his wives. Why is that book in the Bible? Well, the traditional interpretation, certainly the prevalent interpretation in Dunn's day, is that it's a image, it's a depiction, a symbolic or a parable, let's say, of God's love for his people. That uh, God is uh, Solomon, the king who possessed wisdom, 
and that uh, his people are the beloved that Solomon is in love with there. Or again, uh, the, the minor prophet Hosea in the Old Testament, the very beginning of that book, uh, God tells Hosea to go off and marry a prostitute, commands him to do so, in fact. What is the reason? Well, the reason is uh, he marries this prostitute, and then, of course, inevitably she cheats on him, and God uses that uh, image of, the, of that kind of uh, ruined sexual relationship to uh, illustrate for the children of Israel uh, how he feels when they, who should be worshiping him alone, are, cho are worshiping other gods. Uh, and so this notion of the uh, erotic as, a, as one depiction of a close relationship with God, while it may seem shocking to our sensibilities today, I think in Dunn's day it would have been considered uh, perhaps more appropriate. Uh, while we're still on the Holy Sonnets, I would, like to, um, uh, I would like to call your attention to Holy Sonnet 10. I'd mentioned this briefly um, when we were discussing uh, Francis Bacon's essay on death. Uh, and that's the uh, holy sonnet, Death Be Not Proud. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Uh, those you think you overthrow, they don't die poor death. And you cannot kill me, right? Even if I die, well, all that's done has brought me to eternal life. And I think we had talked about this uh, poem in some detail back in that uh, in that uh, lecture, so I'm not going to talk much more about it now, but he goes on to point out how death is uh, like sleep and that death is not nearly as, uh, and death is much weaker than uh, he's given credit for being. And at the very end of the sonnet, notice that uh, Dunn, following Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, says that at the very end, the la Paul says the last enemy uh, at the end of time that shall be conquered is death. And, uh, and uh, Dunn has it here at the end. Uh, One sor short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more death. Thou shalt die. And so it's a poem much concerned with death, as is uh, often the case in literature of the 17th century, and one that uh, tracks rather closely with some of the commonplace ideas that we find in writers like Francis Bacon. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, maybe Dunn's greatest religious poem, Good Friday, 1613, Riding Westward. As the title indicates, we can date this poem with a good degree of accuracy. Good Friday, of course, is the Friday before Easter. This also is para a paradoxical poem built up a steak in the paradoxes of Christianity and the relationship of the human being to God. Um, and uh, the paradox begins with the title because Good Friday is the day on which Christ was died. How can that be good? Well, it can be good because it's the day that uh, human beings ga gain their redemption, and yet it comes paradoxically at the cost of Christ's death. So it begins with a paradox, and paradox run all throughout this poem. Um, by the way, the early biographer of Dunn, whom I've mentioned in our last discussion, Isaac Walton says that on this day, Dunn was going to visit um, his friend, Lady Maudlin Herbert, mother of George Herbert, uh, who is the next writer that we will take up in this course. And now another bit of conceptual background for this poem. That's why I say Dunn, even though he doesn't write a huge amount of poetry, when one discusses Dunn, one has to take one's time because it is difficult as a metaphysical poet and therefore needs to be explained. Uh, he begins by talking about this notion of the sphere. Um, and what Dunn is talking about here is the old Ptolemaic view of the universe, the ancient Greek idea of the universe, which makes perfect sense. It's a perfectly uh, ingenious explanation of the universe for a people that had no refined optical instruments like telescopes and no highly, highly sensitive way to measure. What they relied on was extremely close and careful observation of their eyes. Right? And nobody lived long enough to see great changes in the heavens. I mean, obviously, uh, if, you take a, if, you take a photo, if you look at a photograph of the sky in the year 1900, night sky in the year 1900, and you compare it with a photograph of exactly the same field taken last night, you may be able to detect a very slight uh, change, shift in the position of the stars, because as we know, stars are constantly moving, but the distances involved on these uh, interstellar scales are so vast that you and I can't really perceive these just with the naked eye alone, and our memory isn't exact enough to perceive a shift over the course of, say, 40 or 50 years. Um, 
So the ancient idea, the ancient Greek idea, that uh, the world is a sphere. They knew that from a long time ago. And I hate to break this news to you, my friends, but in 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, intelligent people didn't think Columbus was crazy, that he would sail off the edge of the world. They knew that the world was round, right? They just argued with Columbus about the size of that round world. But at any rate, they knew that the world was a sphere. Then the question is, if you take the moon, which obviously is a solid object, during an eclipse, for instance, it can black out the sun, so it must be a solid object. What keeps that solid object from crashing to the ground? Take any solid object, like your keys, for instance, or a pen, and let go of it, hold it up and let go of it, it'll come crashing down to the ground. Well, the moon, apparently, is up in the sky above your head. What keeps it from crashing to the ground? Well, something obviously must be holding it in place, and something that is invisible. And so the idea came to uh, be held that the moon is itself in a, inside a sphere. Actually, I should revise that. The moon is stuck in the side of a sphere. That sphere encloses the Earth. That sphere is also completely transparent. That's why we can't see it. And that sphere spins round and round the Earth, carrying the moon with it. So think of the Earth as like a marble, and it's enclosed in a perfectly transparent golf ball. And in the side of that golf ball is the moon. And that golf ball spins round and round the Earth, carrying the moon along with it. Same thing is true for the sun. It also is stuck in the side of a perfectly transparent sphere and that sphere spins round and round the Earth, and then each of the uh, planets, each of the seven planets that's visible to the eye, um, is uh, each stuck in its own sphere. By the way, planets look exactly like stars. If you look up at the night sky, it appears that the stars never move, but the planets do. They, want, they move from place to place in the sky, month to month, and that's why they get their name planets, because the ancient Greek verb planao means I wander, right? So these are like stars, that wander. So the idea here is that each of these spheres then that carries a heavenly body spins around and round, and that each of these spheres is presided over in medieval Christian teaching. By the way, the Christians uh, this is uh, liked this uh, view of the universe from the ancient Greeks and adopted it. They added some refinements of their own as, for instance, that each of these spheres that spins round and round is presided over by its own angel or intelligence that ensures that it, uh, spin, that it uh, keeps spinning, even though, as Dunn says early in this poem, when one planet, for instance, gets close to another, it may slow down a bit, but the job of the intelligence is to ensure that over the course of the year, it ends up being where it's supposed to be. That much background to make sense of what Dunn, of how Dunn begins these poems. Let's, let's say, let's suppose, for example, let's, make, let's think up an analogy, he says. Let man's soul be a sphere, and then in this comparison or analogy, the intelligence that moves devotion is. Let's pretend that man's soul is like one of those spheres that's constantly moving. The thing that should be moving your soul, the human soul, is devotion. Everything we do, we should do for love of God. Why do you get up in the morning and eat your breakfast? Because you want to keep your body healthy and well-nourished so you can do what you're going to do in the, throughout the day. Well, what is it you should be doing throughout the day? You should be going about your business, uh, pursuing your calling. Why? Because that's the calling God has for you. So, so everything you do, either remotely or immediately, it should be for the, uh, the glory of God, uh, for your devotion to God. And as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own, and being by others hurried every day, scarce in a year their natural form obey, so uh, we should be moved by devotion, but just as the other spheres sometimes slow down, sometimes speed up, so, in the same way, our souls admit pleasure or business for their first mover. Yes, everything we do, we should do out of devotion to God, and yet, and yet, it's also the case that uh, very often what moves us is pleasure or business instead of devotion. Hence, uh, for their first mover in a whirl by it. That's the reason why. Hence is it that I am carried toward the West this day. So Dunn is um, in London, um, is uh, presumably Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, 
And uh, is what he should be doing on Good Friday is he should be thinking about what happened back east in Jerusalem. He should be he should be quiet. He should be still. He should devote the day to fasting and prayer and meditation about what happened to Christ on Good Friday back east in Jerusalem. But he's not. Pleasure or business has caused him to go visit his friend, and so he's now traveling westward, turning his back, as it were, on his what he should be thinking about. Uh, hence it is I'm carried to the west this day when my soul's form should bend toward the east. And now comes paradox upon paradox. If he were doing what he should be doing, that is meditating about what happened back east, boy, think about the paradoxes. What would ha what happened? Thinking about what happened to Christ on the cross. There I should see a sun by rising, so far so good. Back east you see sun rises. There I should see a sun, and now the pun on sun as in the Son of God, rising. Uh, how, how do you think they got Christ on the cross? Well, standard operation was to lay, lay the cross on the ground, uh, stretch the convict out on it, nail him to the cross while it was on the ground, and then raise that cross up. All right, so there I should see a sun by rising set. So as the Son of God is rising on the cross, he's dying. The paradox of the sun rising in the east at the same moment the sun is setting. There I should see a sun by rising set, and by that setting should cause endless day. What happens with the setting sun is that it brings night, and by that setting endless day beget. But that, that is, uh, unless, oh, except that Christ on this cross did rise and fall. Sin had eternally benighted all. So he sees Christ rising on the cross. That causes Christ to die or causes the sun to set. But the setting of this setting of the sun doesn't bring darkness. It brings the eternal day of salvation. Um, it brings the eternal day. And the only way we could have enjoyed that is if Christ rose and fell on that cross. Uh, otherwise, we would have all been lost in the darkness of sin. On the other hand, he said, he's been berating himself for not meditating about the death of Christ and what's been going on back east, yet dare I almost be glad I do not see that spectacle of too much weight for me. Um, that it's almost, he's almost glad now that he didn't, that he doesn't see what has been happening, uh, what Christ endured on the cross. There's another paradox uh, that he's upset at himself and yet now he's glad at this. Uh, who sees God's face, that is, self-life must die. Again, a, a thing to, uh, a point that we're going to need to pause over. God is self-life. When God, uh, when Moses, uh, when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush and asked Moses to go to Pharaoh and demand that Pharaoh set the children of Israel free, Moses asked the name of the person that was speaking to him from the burning bush, and God gave Moses as his name, uh, Yahweh, I am that I am. Notice God doesn't say at that point, I am love or I am holy. He says simply, I am. I am that I am. And that's always been interpreted as God is existence itself. Everything else that exists, exists because it's like God and God created it. Um, so God is existence itself. Uh, to see existence itself die, to see God die on the cross would have been horrible. Uh, as you see, who sees God's face, that is, self-life, must die. That's a paradox. I think here about Uzzah, for instance, in um, the, I think it's in the book of 1 Samuel, when uh, the children of Israel are transporting the Ark of the Covenant, where God dwells among the ancient Israelites. They're uh, transporting it in a cart, and unfortunately it's about to fall off the back of a cart, and Uzzah, this guy named Uzzah reaches out and steadies the Ark of the Covenant, and perfectly understandably, in order to keep it from falling off the Ark, he's instantly struck dead because he's come into too close contact with God, who is existence itself. So if being too close to God would kill you, imagine what it'd be like to see God, existence itself, die. What a death were it then to see God die. Uh, seeing God die made his own lieutenant nature shrink. So caused an earthquake when Christ died. It made his footstool crack. And the Psalms were told several times that the earth is God's footstool. Well, it made the earth uh, shake with an earthquake. Uh, imagine uh, you, not nearly as powerful as the earth itself. What would it do to you to see God die? And the sun wink. Remember, everything went dark for a period when 
Christ was crucified. Could I behold those hands which span the poles? Here is not just the north and south pole, but since we're talking about all the concentric spheres that constitute the universe, the poles on which the entire universe turns, that God is that mighty, that magnificent. Uh, could I behold those hands which span the poles and tune all the spheres at once, pierced with those holes? There's the paradox. How could a powerful God, God that powerful, have his hands pierced with holes? Could I behold that endless height which is zenith to us and our antipodes? That's the point infinitely above your head, that's zenith, and the point uh, infinitely below your feet, antipodes. Um, could I behold that height, that is God is that great, humbled below us, brought down from the cross and placed into the ground? Or that blood which is the seed of all our souls, if not his, made dirt of dust, uh, God's uh, precious blood uh, sort of pooling down and becoming mud at the bottom of the cross. Again, a paradox. It's impossible to imagine. It's very, or I should say, very difficult to imagine the almighty God, the most powerful being in the entire universe, humbled in that way, made that weak and that vulnerable. Um, uh, or that flesh which was worn by God for his apparel, ragged and torn. So the beating of, if you have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, you'll know what he's talking about here, just the sheer physical brutality that Christ suffered. And again, the Christ is uh, the all-powerful God of the universe. Uh, how paradoxical is it that he is beaten uh, in that fashion? It's a uh, very, very strange and paradoxical thing and something that is very difficult to watch if you've seen that movie. So that's why he says he's almost glad now that he is riding westward and distracted from having to think about these things. And if I dare not look on these things, dare I upon Christ's poor mother cast my eye, who was God's partner here and furnished thus half that sacrifice which ransom. Imagine what it'd be like to see Mary standing there at the foot of the cross, watching her precious and innocent son die for no good reason. Um, that would be difficult as well. Uh, though these things as I ride be, are, are away from my eye, they are present yet unto my memory. So even though he is traveling westward, not contemplating, not looking directly at what happened back east, nevertheless he is pondering them in his memory. For his memory looks toward these events. And as his memory is looking toward Christ on the cross, Christ on the cross is looking directly at the speaker of this poem, uh, which indicates then that Christ's death on the cross was very personal. It was done specifically for the speaker of this poem. And thou looks towards me, O Savior, as thou hangest upon the tree. So uh, the speaker has turned his back, riding westward, and so he imagines then he has turned his back so that Christ can beat him on his back and uh, therefore punish him out of his shortcomings and sins. I turn my back to thee, but to receive thy corrections, till thy mercies bid thee leave. Oh, think me worth thine anger, punish me, burn off my rusts and my deformity. Uh, it sounds very much like the beginning of Holy Sonnet 14, batter my heart, three-person God. Restore thine image by so much. So God creates man in his image. Uh, that image is distorted, is damaged or destroyed at the fall. Uh, and part of the purpose of this life, Dunn would say, uh, Dunn, the great preacher, would say, is to restore, is gradually to restore, to polish up, to refine that image that uh, God created us with so that when we die, it will be ready to greet God in heaven. Restore thine image so much by thy grace that thou mayest know me and I'll turn my face. Only when God's image is restored, only when God has recreated Dunn in his image, can Dunn then actually have, uh, can Dunn be the true and authentic person that he is, and then he can turn his face to God, and the two of them can have the relationship that they should. So, Good Friday, 1613, a poem of great paradox, paradox upon paradox upon paradox. Uh, the hymn to God the Father is perhaps a bit more straightforward. This is a poem that Dunn wrote uh, late in life, and uh, it's usually placed at the end of any collection of poems by John Dunn. And it is really a fitting coda to his work. Uh, it's a poem in which he contemplates death, and he uh, thinks about the fact that now that he's approaching death, uh, he's terrified because he realizes he is sinful. Once again, this consciousness, once he has found the perfect beloved, the perfect object for his love, God, then, paradoxically, he realizes that he himself, the lover, is imperfect. And so uh, here he is 
talking, he is confessing his sinfulness directly to God and wants God to forgive that sinfulness. And only when he knows that God has forgiven all of his sins can he be perfectly and completely at peace in his death. Wilt thou forgive that sin where I begun? That is the original sin. All human beings, according to Don and Orthodox Christian teaching, are born in original sin. Uh, will God forgive that sin, which is my sin, even though it were done before, right? Adam and Eve brought the human beings into original sin, but uh, so you yourself didn't cause the original sin, but by virtue of being human, you're born into it. Presumably, the answer to that question, will God forgive original sin, is yes. All right, uh, how about this? Will you forgive that sin through which I run and do run still, though still I do deplore? How about that sin which has become a bad habit now? and is so very difficult to put aside. Will you forgive that sin? I continue to do it. Presumably the answer to that question is yes. And when thou hast done, thou hast not done, for I have more. So it's a wonderful pun here in these lines. When God has done, that is, has finished forgiving sins, God is still not finished because done has more sin to confess. Right? Um, and also the pun here, when thou hast finished forgiving these sins, that is, you think you have John Donne finally safe and sound. No, you don't have Donne, for John Donne has more sins. Will thou forgive that sin uh, which I have won, that sin which I have won others to sin? Uh, it's one thing for you to sin yourself. How about the sins which encourage others to sin? Go on, take a hit. Everyone's doing it. Uh, is that the kind of sin? Uh, will God forgive that sin, right? Presume and make my sin their door, right? Throwing open the door and asking them to come in and sin with me. Presumably the answer to that question is yes. Okay, how about that sin which I did shun a year or two, but wallowed in a score? How about that sin which I committed again and again and again and have only recently just stopped doing? Um, will God forgive that sin? Well, presumably God will. When thou hast done thou still hast not done, for I have more. And then he confesses his final sin in that final stanza, his sin of fear, as he's eat devout though he is, um, completely dedicated to God though he is, nevertheless at the moment of death is still fear fearful that maybe his sin uh, will in some way be punished and he won't be accepted into heaven. I have a sin of fear that when I have spun my last thread that is approaching death, I shall perish on the shore that God won't actually bring him into heaven. But swear by thyself that at my death thy sun shall shine as he shines now. Here's that pun on sun and sun that we saw in Good Friday 1613. Swear that Christ will continue to share his grace with me, will shine, his, will shine on me then as he has throughout most of my life. And having done that, thou hast done. Then you're completely finished. And then you finally have John done. I fear no more. So wonderful. Uh, resting there in God's grace, um, but also doesn't elide, doesn't, uh, doesn't smooth over the fact that he himself is very sinful and that the best relationship with God, according to Dunn, is one in which one's sins are forgiven, and that brings one even closer to God. So that's our uh, discussion, inadequate and brief though it be, of Dunn's poetry, both the songs and sonnets and the divine poems, but I hope that it has given at least some hints, ideas of some of the main thoughts, some of the main lines of Dunn's thoughts in these poems.